Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the knight by which all other knights in the Iron Kingdoms must be measured against. We're talking about Barristan Selmy or Barristan the Bold. So Barristan is making his appearance in Targaryens as a commander, and with him being a, a entity that originates from the uh, the Seven Kingdoms, he seems to bring a lot of those. Uh, more Westerosi tactics with him. So let's take a look at those to see what he adds into the Targaryen tactics deck. The first card he brings is Press the Advantage. Now this is one we've seen before. It triggers when a friendly combat unit attacks a vulnerable enemy and the attack gains critical blow. Uh, if it happens to be Barristan Selmy's unit that's making the attack, uh, that critical blow goes off on a 5 instead of a 6. So we're going to really lean into this one for sure. I know that it's rough to try and really balance, build a whole list or a whole concept in a list around one card, but I think Press the Advantage is powerful enough to where we really want to make sure that Barristan, just like we would with Roderick, gets into a unit where he can really take good advantage of this because getting critical blow on 5s, especially if you're doing something with rerolls is pretty big and we want to make sure we're getting as much as we can out of that card. The next one we get is Tactical Regroup. This is another uh, recycled card for uh, this particular commander. This triggers when a friendly combat unit activates. Uh, this unit makes a free retreat action and restores up to d3 wounds. If that unit happens to be within long range of Barristan Selmy, any enemies they're disengaged from become vulnerable. So this is a really important card for Targaryen tactics. There aren't a whole lot of survivable units that this army brings along. So think of Dothraki Screamers as a really good example. They go in and charge, and if they don't happen to clear the unit they're going into, which is pretty likely that it's not going to happen because their combat stats aren't that impressive, we can activate them again next turn and and try and re retreat them so they can recoup the wounds that they've lost from the combat they suffered with the unit they were engaged with, and then get back D3 wounds so that that will hopefully get them back into full fighting order, and they would happen to be uh, making the unit they're disengaging from vulnerable, so that helps with things like uh, Press the Advantage or some other cards for Barristan Selmy. But the other thing this really does for them is just make it so that their charge is a little bit more impactful, so they can kind of have two combats where they get to do what they uh, want to, which is just kind of wiping the enemy. Dothraki don't really like staying in combat for a very long time. Even the veterans don't really enjoy this. They like to be kind of bulldozing through units uh, one by one, so this card kind of helps them get there. The next card that Barristan brings is Legendary Boldness. After a friendly combat unit is attacked, if they pass a panic test, the unit makes uh, one melee attack targeting the attacker. After the attack's been completed, uh, if they didn't kill the enemy, they end up suffering two wounds. So this is a really fun card to see coming into the Targaryen mix. This is a very uh, Baratheon-feeling card. Now, the this kind of further forwards that motion that I had set before where... Uh, Targaryens like to take advantage of tempo by bulldozing through units, even though it's not something that they're, they seem to be baked into doing. But Legendary Boldness makes sure something like this can happen, and out of turn sequence as well. So if you're looking at trying to, you charge into something, you don't kill it, they attack you back, then you can play something like Legendary Boldness to try and wipe that unit out. This also works on a turn where you don't have real control over what's going on, like your opponent has the top of the turn, and they want to try and take advantage by whittling down a unit and making it a little bit less effective, they're going to have to think twice because Legendary Boldness is out there. So uh, every single card that Barristan ends up bringing seems to really put forward this notion of aggression in the Targaryen uh, army. I think that he can really take some of our more elite units and turn them up to uh, 11. So Barristan Selmy comes to us as an on-the-table commander, and uh, we've gone over the benefits of this a bunch of times. The only real downside to this is that having Barristan Selmy as your commander means that you can't take him as your NCU, and his NCU is really nice for this army because the Targaryens have a lot of high-value units that you don't want being messed with, and we just have to be cognizant of that when we come into like list selection or when we're preparing for a battle against a friend. 
Uh, Barristan Salmi has an order called Indomitable, and this triggers when a unit passes a morale test. That unit can then restore D3 wounds. This is really nice for making sure that his unit sticks around for the long haul. You know that you're going to be going into an enemy, and if you happen to take some damage by not uh, wiping that enemy out and they get that retaliatory attack, uh, you can put him in a unit where the morale is pretty decent and make sure that they can get d3 wounds every time they get smacked. Uh, the, this could also de-incentivize your opponent from attacking Barristan Salmi's unit just like you would if you were to put his Lannister version into one of their units because uh, they're going to be fueling up their wounds quite quickly and it's going to be hard to wipe that unit out. You kind of might get into this position where uh, you can't you just get tar pitted by them, and they're just going to do what they want to anyways. The big difference between this version of Barristan Salmi and the Lannister one is that the units we can put Barristan in with this list are a lot more dangerous. Barristan Selmy also brings one more ability that we've seen before, and this is Nightly Vow. Uh, before deployment, you can select one enemy unit. Until the end of the game, this unit's melee attacks gain plus one to hit and roll plus two dice against that enemy. This is a really fun ability. I think it's a, a really cool controlling one where you can kind of pick a unit that Barristan Selmy is really good being matched up into, and then just make sure that your opponent doesn't really keep that... Uh, that unit near you. It might even keep them from deploying them early if they're a unit that wants to kind of dictate where things go. Uh, think of like another person's commander, making sure that you kind of leave Barristan off the table until they slam that commander down uh, can really dictate the objectives that your opponent has the opportunity to go after. So I think Knightly Vow doesn't look like it's a very deep ability when you first read it, but the mind games that can happen through deployment and maneuvering on the table can really mess with your opponent's head. So what unit are we going to be putting Barristan in? Well, we're going to reach into one of the units that I now think is being released on uh, July 24th in the U.S., but I know a lot of us have our hands on it already, myself included, and that would be the Unsullied Swordmasters, and we talked about these guys in the Dario video, so it's not really surprising that we're going to be having this unit holding our commander again. They have some really great stats, which we've gone over before, but having a 4-plus save and a 4-plus morale is really nice. You don't miss having a really amazing save with this unit when you combine the 4-plus morale with Indomitable. That means that your opponent, almost every attack they put into them isn't going to really do much to the overall health of the unit because Barristan's going to keep fueling them back up. And we've got tons of dice we're throwing with this one, so when we combine something like Knightly Vow, our opponent is not going to want to get anywhere near this unit because they'd be throwing 12 dice when they're full, 9 dice when they're at medium, and then 8 dice on their last rank. The plus 1 to hit isn't really that big of a deal. We're not taking the advantage of that with this one because the Unsullied Swordmasters end up hitting on 2+, plus, but we end up kind of trading that anti-synergy or that lost benefit for getting a lot of value out of uh, Press the Advantage because when you have a 2+, plus to hit, you just re-roll all of your attack dice, and you don't have to worry about ever having anyone mess with your really good critical blows, because this unit can never really have the, the weakened condition token put on them, so we, uh, we get to do some pretty nasty stuff with this one. If you're charging Barristan into his Knightly Vow unit, you're throwing 12 of dice that hit on twos and you're re-rolling every single and it's not even miss re-roll every single die that is not a six or a five because i feel like the risks of hitting more misses is very much worth the risk or the benefit or the reward of hitting more fives and sixes you've got you know a 33 ish percent chance on every single die to get critical blow out of this and i feel like that's a pretty welcome coin or not coin toss it'd be a weird looking coin right but it's a it's an interesting metric to put into play when you're th looking at throwing that many dice and getting those critical blows i think the unsullied sword masters especially at speed six with precision uh really do a lot of work there that precision is going to help out with press the advantage as well so there's really just the only thing that we don't get out of this is that plus one to hit off of knightly vow but if you remember that we're kind of playing it as more of a control tactic and less is trying less trying to 
seek out the knightly vow target that we're trying to get into, then this is a really great ability, and the Unsullied Sword Masters are just going to be straight rude with this unit. And remember that Legendary Prowess is going to be pretty likely to go off without taking any wounds at all because this unit just does so much damage in close combat. The next units we're bringing are two units of Dothraki Screamers. So the you'll see that there's a lot of similarities with the last list that I built so far. In that I'm bringing the one unit of Unsullied Swordmasters and then the two units of Dothraki Screamers. I still think that these units are really good for kind of following around Barristan's unit to try and help tag team or to take down anything that he happens to go into you could do fun things like have the screamers go first into a flank to whittle the unit down and then that will ensure that barristan's unit can take out the opposing unit when they go in and then do something like trigger overrun after that to make sure barristan gets another charge in and then you can activate that second unit of screamers and then you can just start steamrolling through your opponent's units. I think one of the things that's really hard to see when you're looking at Targaryens is that they do like that tempo control of the game. They like to really keep their own pace, and I think that having two Screamers can really help forward that mentality. I don't think that Targaryens are the most straightforward army to play, but they definitely get a little bit easier when you try to frame them like this. I definitely recommend trying it out if you're having some problems getting this army to function. The other things that we're doing with these Screamers is that we're adding some attachments to them because we've kind of got the points for it. And uh, with the Targaryens not having the greatest access to cheaper options, it, it works out for what we're doing here. One of the units of Screamers is getting an Outrider Co. And uh, that's really just because Mark the Target can help turn on some of the other abilities. Like if you have a, a Press the Advantage in your hand, and you don't have the ability to go after the tactic zone, having this this Outrider Co. hanging around is going to make sure that you can take full advantage of that. So I really wouldn't leave... I wouldn't really play a Barristan Sell Me list without having one or two of these in here. For the next unit of Screamers, I did put a Screamer Co. on them. You could switch this to an Outrider if you really wanted to, but for me, I just wanted something that can crack a little bit harder because we could potentially have some issues into stronger armor with this list and I know that only one unit with Sundering is not going to really make a huge difference here but when we look at trying to clean up something like something that got into Selmy's unit or we're trying to clean up something that Selmy's unit is on uh, the Screamer Co. can really help us get there with having Sundering. Uh, if you feel like the flank bonus is going to be enough for you or if you feel like you're playing opponents who don't have the maneuverability to uh, get things on the side so they can deny flank charges then I really wouldn't worry too much about this and just switch it to an outrider to make sure that you've got this uh, vulnerable on tap. The last combat unit we're bringing in here is a unit of Stormcrow mercenaries. Uh, the the attachment for these is really kind of the big reason why we're doing this. There's a little bit, there's a lot of synergy mixed into this unit right now. And I think that's kind of the cool thing about Stormcrow Mercs and why I feel like they're going to be such a really big deal in the Targaryen army is because with the, uh, with the motivated by, or the adaptive ability, sorry, they can really be customized. They're kind of like a blank slate unit that has some cool abilities on their own, but then be being able to take an attachment for one point less is a really big deal. And the one that we've decided to put in here is Brianna, the, the Maiden of Tarth. So the, the big reason for this is Stalwart is going to help this unit out quite a bit if we ever have to put Legendary Boldness on them. And the second reason why is because having two instances of Knightly Vow running around the table is going to be really hard for our opponent to figure out what they're trying to do with uh, with the rest of their army in terms of positioning, right? It's really difficult when you're playing against a Targaryen player who kind of has this momentum through uh, press forward, or not press forwards, but for surge fourths to kind of deny these Knightly Vow targets. I think previously uh, in any game you've ever played with Brienne, it's a little more difficult to kind of get her get it get her into her nightly vow target but when you've got Selmy running around with this really scary unit and have Brienne there too i think it's difficult for your opponent to kind of get away from any of that he's going they're they're going to end up giving you one of your nightly vow targets and as the game kind of you know slips down the slope for them 
it's going to get to the point where both of these are probably going to get their nightly vow targets. And when the Stormcrow mercenaries are hitting on twos and throwing like nine, or they're hitting on threes and throwing nine dice at full, the rest of that decay, that five to three, doesn't get so bad when you see five to, or seven to five. So I think that this unit ends up getting a lot of benefit from having Brienne in it, especially only at one point, and uh, it helps out with some of the things that Barristan's trying to bring along too. Now, one of the things that you could do in this list is maybe start shaving some points off NCUs or attachments to try and get maybe Jorah in here. Being a, a cheap activation is nice. Now, I know Jorah is more of a meme right now than anything because I think that Jorah just doesn't function the way that I think Coolman you're not intended him to function. Uh, he's just too pillow fisted. He doesn't have great stats and his ability really puts him at risk. So you're really not getting any true advantage out of his like uh, marking the target esque ability. So instead of dra grabbing Jorah the Wandering Knight, we are going with Illyrio Mopatis as the first of our three NCUs. And a lot of this is because he's three points. I mean, you could shave one of the out one of the uh, Co's off of the Screamer unit in order to get up to a four-point NCU. But I do think having Barristan Selmy in here with that Dothraki unit or maybe getting a clutch Stormcrow Mercenary play into their Nightly Vow target with Illyrio's boon could be enough here to make sh to, to warrant his inclusion. Now, getting him to go off is a little bit more difficult, especially if Varus is very present in your meta, but being able to do something like this and get some extra activations out of a unit is really powerful and i think that illyrio's inclusion in here is very well justified just with the death star type situation we've got going on with uh barristan selmy for the second ncu i am grabbing denarius targaryen another starter box inclusion i think some people might not really appreciate her being in this list uh, i think she's one of the more undervalued ncus that happens to come with the targaryens mostly because there are cards within commanders or in the targaryen deck that do what she does already but i think again having uh these death star investments i don't really want to have to deal with ever getting disordered and being able to make barristan's unit speed seven and make sure that he can reroll his charge distances is really potent and powerful i think that she's not a superfluous ncu and i really don't look at any of the other four point options maybe outside of something like varus and think that he that they should be in here instead of her varus is a very good inclusion because it can stop your opponent from playing ncus that might mess with Barristan's unit. That's kind of one of the big things that we'll hammer on later of things to avoid with this list. And our final NCU is uh, one that I, I don't know if people would consider this a controversial choice or not, but uh, Payet Pri is a really unique NCU for the game. He ends up bringing a whole new spot on the tactics board that we can utilize. And since we have three NCUs, the real reason for his inclusion is just to make sure that we can take full advantage of these zones. I know that our opponent can go through and rip out a lot of the cards that we have to kind of limit the effectiveness of Barristan Selmy, but when they do something like take the House of Undying first, it means that they're not taking things like the Tactic Zone or the Combat Zone. I think that there's a real big roadblock to uh, doing anything or trying to counterplay us with the House of Undying. If you haven't seen it yet, the House of Undying is uh, just, it, it's just a big tarot-sized card that kind of gets bolted onto your Tactics board, and uh, this is when you claim the zone, you end up rolling a die. On a one, your opponent discards their hand of tactics cards and then uh, may place up to two conditions on one of your combat units. The On a result of two to five, your opponent discards the top two cards of their deck. And then on a six, you search your tactics deck for any one tactics card and place it in your hand and then shuffle your deck. And then you have to roll again. So the House of Undying is really interesting play zone on the tactics board and like i said your opponent's going to be going after this just because of some of the real cool powerful effects that it brings with it but uh payette pre also can adjust 
the roll on this one. So they're already incentivized to not let you have it. And if we're doing things like taking that tactic zone or taking the combat zone, when our opponent's trying to kind of snipe this out from under us, it means that we're able to stack our deck with a lot more of those cards. We just really want to hope that they don't roll that one to kind of stop our cultivation of these cool things we've got going on. I think that this really makes sure that Illyrio can unpack when he needs to, because I think that you might often find yourself where your opponents kind of filled up the tactics board a little faster than you in order to make sure that Illyrio can't come onto the board or has to come on at a point where you really don't want him to. So I think that the House of Undying is reason enough to include him, but I wouldn't judge anyone for wanting to take this particular NCU out of their list because they're just too worried about giving their opponent a really powerful tool to aid in trying to mess with their game plan. Now, I'd said things to avoid with this list. I think that since we don't have Varus in here, and we don't have Barristan's NCU in here, that we really want to avoid dropping this list into things that have other Varuses or Walder Freys hanging around. Uh, we we want to make sure we've, we've put a lot of investment into the list construction around making the veteran, or including the, uh, or making sure that the unsullied swordsman can work and if our opponent has a way to kind of throw uh, that unit under the bus then we really don't want to be giving them that opportunity this kind of makes it so that the any opposing lannisters might not be the greatest thing to drop this list into i know that we've got a couple stalwart or not stalwart we've got one stalwart unit walking around so the panic checks aren't so bad but they do have a lot of cards that stop things that we're trying to do, and Counterplot can be really devastating if we're trying to unpack a really clutch Legendary Boldness or press the advantage. And if your opponent's anywhere near cognizant of what the Targaryen deck can do, they're going to save for some of those big cards. Now, they can't stop all of them because that means they're not paying thing, attention to things like Overrun, but it is definitely something that we want to avoid. So if I were building this for any kind of competitive purpose, I would try and build my off list as something to kind of go into those others that doesn't really care too much about having their units messed with. Now, I feel like we've kind of just scratched the surface on Targaryen list building. I did mention Caldrogo with a bunch of Screamers, and the last two lists I've talked about have really kind of had this straightforward approach of include Swordmasters and then add in little units to make it work. And I think that once more releases come out for the Targaryens, we'll start to see a little bit more diversity in their builds, and I do think some upcoming FAQs might kind of address some of the difficulties that we get presented with when building with a Targaryen list. Having your your entry level troops costing six points right away is kind of rough for list building. Uh, not that I think that Screamers will go down to five. I'd be really happy if they did. I think they'd start to become part of the discussion in really good five point units. But at six points, it just really makes it difficult for you to make your list work the way you want it to. Uh, and up end up I end up making Stormcrow Mercenaries more of my core unit with Targaryen builds. So uh, it's it's not it's not un you're not unable to do something that's just Targaryen focused. It's just that you really like having those lower point units in order to make sure that you can make room for some of the bigger ones. I think probably the next Targaryen commander we will talk about is that Khal Drogo off list that I was discussing. I know some people were really looking forward to hearing about Grey Worm, but I think I'll give it a little bit of time because, shocker, there's going to be Unsullied in that list too. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this tactic, tactics discussion. If you have any uh, requests for the future, please leave them below. I think I've got one more request that's kicking around out there that I need to deal with, which I should be getting to really soon. But I think we've kind of talked about Targaryens enough to kind of forgive my, my ignoring them for so long. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's the end of them. We're going to end up hitting all of these in the very near future. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.